All right, well, good morning. Thank you for joining us this morning. I know some of you drove quite a distance to be here, uh, coming up from San Antonio or Corpus, and I know some of you flew quite a ways to be here, too. I see some friends from Florida and the other side of the country and northern, from Northern California, so thank you for making the travel arrangements to be here and for sharing your Saturday morning with us. Well, we have a great program for you, so I'd like to run you through the itinerary of, of today's events. Our first speaker is going to be Arnold, and he's going to talk about the positive trends in the economy, and then he's going to talk about the areas of concern. He's going to talk about investment opportunities and how we invest in an environment like we have today. And where are we in the market today? And his talk is going to go for an hour and 15 minutes. After Arnold's talk, we're going to have a 15-minute break. It'll be our only break between the speakers, so take advantage of that time. Stand up, stretch, another cup of coffee. We'll also have some more refreshments for you out here. And then when we come back, we're going to bring up Senior Portfolio Manager Steve Shipman. Steve's going to talk about the difference between risk and volatility. It's a question we get with the market environment. We see volatility, whether in the market or in the portfolio. And so we want to take this opportunity to share with you how we view risk and volatility within the century investment process. Steve's uh, section is going to take 20 minutes. And then without a break, we're going to bring up our co-chief investment officer, Jim Brilliant. And Jim's going to talk to you about the value gap, that is the difference between price and value. And then he's going to just uh, talk briefly about our valuation process. But he's going to spend most of his time talking about how we try to recognize structural shifts within industries and throughout our economy. And then he's going to give you three investment themes that are taking advantage of these structural shifts and then drill down further still and, and let you know the companies in our portfolio today that are in these three investment themes. And Jim's section is going to take 40 minutes. So now it's time to get on with our program and we're gonna bring up our first speaker, Arnold. Uh, as you, many of you know, Arnold was licensed in the securities business uh, back in 1968, so this is his 45th year in the investment business. And as an acknowledgement to his investment success, uh, Arnold was re recently featured in a new book that came out this summer titled The World's 99 Greatest Investors. And in this book, he shares the pages with some of the household names like Warren Buffett or T. Rowe Price, uh, Peter Lynch, John Templeton. So we're all very proud of of him for his accomplishments over the past four decades to be included in, in, uh, in such a great book. Now, as a side note, and I believe it's an important one, and I know that Arnold would, would want me to mention this uh, as well, uh, and that is that he started in the business 45 years ago, but started Century Management 39 years ago. And our co-chief investment officer, Jim Brilliant, has been with Arnold uh, and by his side for the past 27 years. And Jim has also made great contributions to our long-term track record. So I just want to acknowledge Jim and what he has brought to the table and his contributions to this performance as well. Now, we gave this uh, presentation last week in Houston, two weeks ago in Pasadena, California. And we've been working on this for the past eight weeks, made recent updates uh, now that the September 30 numbers came out on a number of slides. So I know he's very excited to share his thoughts with you this morning. So if you'll all please join me in welcoming my father, Arnold. Thank all of you for coming here for the 2013 Century Management Client Review. Before I get started, I want to acknowledge our company and our employees who have worked unbelievably hard to get this program going. Uh, I don't want to take the time to mention everybody, but I wanted to thank everybody at Century Management. They're all here today and given us tremendous support. This kind of effort takes a lot of dedication on many people who never really get recognized, so I wanted to thank them for it. Also, my wife has not been able to attend these past seminars because of an illness, but I'm proud and happy to see her in the front row this morning, so I want to thank her. <laughs> in 
as Scott said, the first thing we're going to talk about is the positive trends in this country. And the reason we're going to talk about that is because when you read the newspaper and you hear things on the news, you would think that there's not anything good going on in this country. And there is tremendous, tremendous accomplishments that are going on every day, and it never ceases to amaze me that these are not out in the front pages. So we want to be sure to make you understand some of these positive trends. On the second part, I'm also talking about the areas of concern. And there are many areas of concern, and we're going to talk about them in detail. So I want to give you a balanced approach so you really understand what the positives are, what the negatives are, and how we intend to work through these. There are so many technological breakthroughs that are happening today and are coming in the next five to ten years that it truly looks like there's going to be another industrial revolution. But the three areas we're going to talk about is the low-cost energy fueled by the breakthrough in natural gas fracturing, the manufacture renaissance that is inspired by low-cost energy and technology, and this is just an amazing area, and then we have a very important real estate recovery going, and that's a very important part because that's 22 to 24 percent of the economy. So we're going to start with the natural gas. I spoke about that last year. Matter of fact, I've been speaking about it for a couple of years. But what is really amazing is here is natural gas and oil drilling. That's been, fracturing has been going on since 1947. So all of this time they've been doing this, but in the last few years there's been such an incredible breakthrough in it that even though it's been going on for 60 or 70 years, they are making incredible breakthroughs. And because of that, because we're getting the cost of natural gas and oil down, major companies from all over the world are establishing plants here, and some of our local companies are increasing their plants because of the low-cost energy. Exxon is building a $10 billion plant, CF Industry a $2 billion, Dow Chemical, multi-billion company. And the strangers of all things, Aramsco, which is an Egyptian company that is establishing plants here because they can now get energy cheaper in the United States than in the Middle East. Who would have ever thought that you would have a Middle Eastern company coming over here to establish plants? It's one of the biggest fertilizer companies in the world. Now, just to show you how that breakthrough is coming, I've shown three or four areas here in what they're doing in the fracturing, and these are the days required to drill a well. Now, if you look at the Haynesville, it used to take 50 days to drill a well. They've got it down to 37 days. In the Eagle Fort area, 38 days used to take, now they've got it down to 20. In the Marcellus, it used to take 28 days, now it takes 17. So when you put all of these things together, they have reduced the time to drill a well by 38%. And this is a technology that's been around for 50 years, and just in the last few years, in the last three years, they've increased it by 38%. In addition to that, some of the steps in fracturing, even in the last six to nine months, there's no end to this, they have reduced the time by 50%. This is an extraordinary achievement, and look what it's doing for our production of natural gas and oil. This is North Dakota, where a big big uh, drilling effort is going on, and you can see that in 2006, they were only drilling 100,000 barrels a day. In 2013, they're drilling 800,000. So the, the amount of drilling has gone up eight times, and since 2011, their production has doubled. This is truly an amazing feat, and it has extraordinary consequences all throughout the economy. Energy affects every industry in the world, and the cutting the cost down is just going to be an amazing thing. In addition to that, as I was flying to the LA seminar, there was a big headline in the Wall Street Journal that we now have become the top producer in oil and gas, even over Russia. So we are now the top producer in oil and gas, and by 2017, we're actually going to be exporting natural gas. And the profitability in that is amazing. But let me just give you the bottom line of how it affects you as an individual consumer. 
There's a company called Global Insights, which does research all over the world, and they've concluded that in 2012, you have reduced your cost in your personal budget by $1,200 after taxes and inflation. So basically, this is just like a tax cut. In 2015, they're projecting that it'll save the average consumer $2,000 a year, and by 2025, up to $3,400. This is an extraordinary achievement, and this is something that the government can't do for you. No matter what they want to do to increase your disposable income, there is nothing that they can do that will give you that kind of benefit. And that is the benefit of the free enterprise system. This is the benefit of technology. And this is going to affect everybody, including manufacturing. Now, <clears throat> let's talk about manufacturing. Because this is where the big breakthrough is coming. And we are going to eventually become, and are becoming, the low-cost producer in manufacturing, even beating out China. I'm going to show you how that works. The technological revolution in manufacturing is started by 3D printing, robotics, artificial intelligence, and nanotechnology. There are so many things that these technologies combined can do that it really uh, stretches the imagination, but I'm going to try to give you a couple of them. First of all, through these technologies, they're going to be able to make materials that are lighter than steel and 10 times as strong. So we're actually creating new, new products and materials through these technologies. They're going to have a little box, no bigger than a, a sugar cube, that can hold the entire Library of Congress. A device that travels through the human body that is so small that you can swallow it, and it goes on to destroy cancer cells. They have a technology now that can spray on solar cells onto a piece of paper, just like you're printing something. You create a solar cell, and it's going to cut the cost of solar energy way down which is another revolution in itself. And then the ultimate, within the next 10 years, <clears throat> they are taking 3D printers, they're taking your body cells, and they literally are reproducing bones. There's people who have had their jaws replaced by a 3D printer that takes your cells, builds the jaw bone right from the cells, so there's no rejection of the body against the foreign tissue, and it's going to be able to replicate bones. The ultimate that they're working on, and they are one-third of the way there, is ultimately they're going to be able to print body parts, like a kidney. They are about five to ten years away from actually producing a kidney that is made out of your own tissue, and that is put into the body as a replacement without any problems at all. Now to show you <coughs> what artificial intelligence will do, You've heard about, in 1979, there was a big breakthrough in artificial intelligence uh, because IBM was able to design a computer to beat the world chess champion from Russia. This was an incredible breakthrough for a computer to be able to beat one of the world's greatest chess champions. And they did this through artificial intelligence. But just to show you how far they've come, they have now created a robot with artificial intelligence that has landed a full-blown fighter jet on an airplane, on an aircraft carrier. And this is something that is only used by the greatest pilots that we have to be able to land a plane on an aircraft carrier. And they have done this twice now in July. The other thing that the artificial intelligence was able to do, there's a couple of times where it couldn't land, it aborted the mission, and it landed safely on land. <clears throat> so this is an amazing thing when you think about the fact that artificial intelligence and robotics has advanced so much that they can actually replace a fighter pilot. But if artificial intelligence is enough to stretch your imagination, I want to take you one step further. And this is something that I've had a very difficult time getting my arms around, because this is a whole new world. It's called molecular manufacturing. And so what it does is it creates manufacturing at a level, at the atomic level. In other words, you can take a couple of atoms, turn it into a molecule, and make body parts. Now, just to give you an idea of how small that world is, if you took the human body, <clears throat> and you tried to figure out how many atoms are in the human body, 
There was a professor, uh, Don Andrews, in the 30s that calculated this for his chemistry class. And he started off by saying, okay, I'm going to use a P to represent an atom, and then I'm going to figure out how many atoms there are in the body. So he said, if you filled the whole United States with atoms, four feet deep in P's, you wouldn't get there. So he filled the whole earth full of P's, four feet deep, still didn't do it. Finally, at the final calculation, he came up with one octillion atoms, which is 250,000 Earths, four feet deep in P's. And that's one octillion. So you got 250,000 Earths, four feet deep in P's, and that is the level that they're going to be manufacturing on. Now, to give you one more example, if you take a pin, the head of a pin, it's got five million atoms across. They now have discovered a way to make glass, are you ready for this, two atoms thick. So if the top of a pin is five million atoms, this is only two atoms, and this is going to go into computers and transistors and everything to do with technology. This is an amazing breakthrough, and all of these things together are going to make the United States the supreme low-cost producer which is bringing people from all over the world, not only with their talents, but with their corporations. Now, in the last 10 or 15 years, I'm sure that all of you have heard about how many companies went overseas to China to be able to tap their low-cost labor. Matter of fact, many major corporations have plants over there to be able to take advantage of the low cost. They are now coming back to the United States Dow Chemical, GE, Ford, and Calabella to produce four major companies that are bringing their, bringing their plants back into America because of the low-cost gas and because of the technology breakthrough. And the main breakthrough here is in robotics. For example, China is so concerned about this, they have a company over there called Foxconn. They have already produced 20,000 rob robots and those robots are producing materials cheaper than their labor force. So now, because of the fact that they can produce it cheaply over there with robotics, they still have the problem of shipping it back and forth overseas, which is a huge cost disadvantage for them. Foxconn is now creating companies in the United States with robotics and is producing goods for the United States, and this is going to create a lot of opportunities for people in this country. Now think about this. If even five years ago you could have thought about a Middle Eastern company coming over to America because of low-cost energy and a Chinese company coming over here because we can beat their labor costs. This was even unthinkable five or seven years ago and here we're seeing it before our very eyes. And just to give you a demonstration of that, we moved out of California for many reasons, because of the bureaucracy and many other reasons, which I won't go into detail. But we all know that California is probably the most expensive place because of the welfare system, because of the taxes, and because of the bureaucracy. It's probably the worst place to do business. If you want to put in a low-cost operation, you don't think about going to California. Here is Tesla, an electrical company, a company that makes electric cars, is producing competitively cars in California by using robotics. They have 160 robots that are producing 400 cars a week, and they plan on doubling that by next year. So this is an incredible demonstration of what America has to offer when it comes to these things. Now, with all these wonderful things going on in technology and in these industries, you would say, well, that's the place to invest. Well, I would say not usually, and I'm going to show you why. We will invest in any of these companies, and we have in the past, but the problem with these companies are they're started by young entrepreneurs. They're not proven in their ability to manage a company, even though they have the right technology. And there's a lot of risk in these companies. You never know which one is going to make it and which one isn't. In addition to that, these companies sell at very high multiples because they have all the growth ahead of them. So you're paying extraordinary prices for unproven companies 
with one thing going to technology, but that's not enough to make it. And I'm going to show you that. Guess what the great technology breakthrough were in the turn of the century? It was the automobile. Everybody was using horse and buggy and manual labor, and here we had the car coming. This was the technological breakthrough of the turn of the century. They produced over 1,800 cars. 1,800 individual car companies were produced. How would you ever know which one was going to survive out of the three or four that survived? You all heard about Hudson, Studebaker, Packard, Nash Rambler. I even owned a Nash Rambler at one time. Those companies are not around anymore, and there's only three or four companies left. So it would have been extremely difficult, even though you saw it coming, to try to pick the com company that was going to be the winner. So how do you make money on this knowledge? You make money at the turn of the century, you could have made a lot of money by investing in steel, by investing in aluminum, by investing in electric parts, rubber for tires and other supply, without knowing or caring which company was going to be successful because these products are used in all automobiles. So if you invest in the picks and shovels instead of going mining, you're going to make money no matter who is successful. So our strategy is to follow these technologies to look at the companies that are going to benefit from it and to buy those proven companies that benefit from the technology, not the technology themselves. Let me give you an example. At the turn, at the 1800s, as you all know, there was a big gold rush. Everybody went mining for gold. Levi Strauss made their fortune, made more money selling jeans to miners than anybody did mining gold. And that's our theory. When there's a gold rush, you invest in the picks and shovels, and you make a lot of money, and you don't have to guess who's going to be the top one in the area. Now, you've heard me talk a lot about 3D systems, especially last year. And for those of you who haven't heard the story, I just want to repeat it, because this is an extraordinary feat that's been going on. Now, 3D printing actually got started about 20 or 30 years ago, but just like the breakthrough in technology and fracturing, it's only taken off in the last five to seven years. And what it is called, it's additive printing. So what you do is you get a blueprint, you put it in a machine just like a printer, and then you have the raw material come into the machine and it prints it layer by layer. It doesn't cut something out of wood or steel, it literally builds it from the ground up. And by building it from the ground up, you get an accuracy that you could not get under any other process. The advantages to 3D printing are so immense that it's hard to figure out just what it's going to be. It's about a $2 billion industry, but let me give you the main benefits of 3D printing. It costs, the savings by using 3D printings are as high as 70%. You have a quick turnaround, you have less waste, almost 60% less waste, because instead of cutting something out of a raw material, you're building it from the ground up, so there is no waste. You have new shapes and designs and figures that were not possible under any other process, and you have new business models for entrepreneurs. The amount of things that they can do with 3D printing is truly amazing, and uh, GE is already using some of the 3D printing to build some of their engines for their uh, electrical divisions. Now let's take a look at 3D systems because there's a company called 3D Systems who's the pioneer in this, and let's take a look at whether this would be a good idea to invest in the company. Now, first of all, we as value investors, the first thing we look at, no matter how great something is, is how cheap is it? Can we make money? Is there a low risk situation? That's the most important thing. We can think of a lot of things that are gonna do great, but we don't know how much risk there is on the downside. Now, just to give you an example, 3D printing, and I'm going to use a very common metric that you use in this business. We use many different metrics, but let's just use one to make it real simple. And that is what we call a price to sales. In other words, a company has $100 million in sales, it probably sells for $100 million, one-time sales. Century management's portfolio, every stock in your portfolio combined is selling at 0.83 of sales. That means less than one-time sales. 
The Russell 3000, which is big and small company, sells at about 1.15 times sales. The S&P, which has 500 of the largest companies in the United States, sells at 1.45 times sales. 3D printing is selling at 11 times sales. So you get the idea that this company is very highly priced relative to any other measure you want to use. Well, why is it selling that high? Because of the growth potential. People are looking at the growth and saying, wow, this is going to be a big thing. But that stock is already probably discounting five or ten years growth. And if it doesn't happen, look out below. Now, let me give you an example. Every technology company, when it starts, sells at high multiples of sales. Apple sold at one time at 7.4 times sales. Right now, it's selling at 2.6 times sales. Dell sold at 8 times sales. It's selling at 0.4 of sales. Intel sold at 16 times sales. Uh, it's selling at 2.2. Cisco sold at 39 times sales, and it's selling at 2.6, and Amazon sold at 197 times sales, and it sells at 2.2 times sales. So the point I'm trying to make is, whenever these companies mature, no matter what the multiples are on the top, they're going to go down to about 2 times sales. Now, the sales of 3D system is $4 per share. If, God forbid, something happened to that company, and it sold at 2.4 times sales, or 2 times sales, it would be selling at $8. Even if it grew and doubled for three years, and the sales were $8 a share, and it sold down and sells at two times sales, it'd be $16. The stock is at $56 today. So from $56 down to eight or 16, that's a long ways down. That's far too much risk than we would ever want to take. Now, let's assume that everything turns out right for 3D printing. So I made a projection that for the next 10 years, they're going to grow at 25% a year. They have never even grown that much since they began, but I'm just going to give it the benefit of the doubt so you get the idea. So we're going to grow it out for 10 years, 25% a year. Their sales would go from $4 to $37. But if at that time it sold the two times sales, the stock would go to $74. Well, if it went to $74 from 56, that's about a 3% return over 10 years. That is not something worthwhile or even to reach for. But to think that if something would go wrong, that it would go down to $16 or $20 a share, you've got a lot of downside and very little upside. And as Jim will show you later on in the session, we like to get a little bit on the downside and a lot on the upside. This ratio is completely reversed. And therefore, we would not consider buying it at this particular price. Just to give you a little insight, the insiders are selling 25% of their stock. So you kind of think about if all, this, all these great things are going to happen, why are the insiders selling it? Because they understand, like we do, that eventually something is going to slow down. Stock may not be that high. But just to give you an idea, when I first got in this business, I was very enthusiastic about this one stock. I used to talk to the president all the time. He told me all the glorious things they were doing. Everybody was happy. We were making money. And one day I woke up, went to the office, and there's an article saying that the insider's selling a big block of stock. I thought, God, why would he be selling this stock after he told me how great this thing is? So I called him up and I said, hey, uh, I just noticed that you guys are selling a lot of stock. Why are you doing that if it's such a great company? And he says, well, I've got a son going to college. So I thought, oh, OK. So I went back to my desk and I figured, 5 million shares at $20 a share, that's $100 million. That is one hell of a college. Can you imagine how smart this guy is going to be when he graduates from that college? So the point I'm making is when insiders are selling, that is usually not a good sign. It doesn't mean that stock's going to go down. But it does mean that maybe the insiders would prefer to diversify, as the, 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 the other words they use is, I'm just diversifying my holding. Well, I don't like to diversify my holding if I've got a big winner. So if this company was a big winner, I don't think they'd be diversifying. So you're going to learn a lot about these new technologies. You're going to read articles about it. And you're going to want to be tempted to buy these stocks. And I'm cautioning you 
don't buy the stocks in Leicester at multiples that are reasonable because there's many ways that we can make money by investing in things that are related to that. Now let me just remind you of something that I shouldn't have to remind you of, but let me bring you up the situation in the tech bubble. Do you remember in the tech bubble where the market, the internet was coming out and tech stocks were going at 50 and 100 times, they weren't making any money and nobody cared because you were just going to make a lot of money. And they made proclamations for these companies that actually came true. Everything they said about the internet did come true. The problem is if you look at the NASDAQ, which was all technology stocks, it reached 5,000 at the peak. It came down. And here it is 14 years later, and it's still down 25%. What happened? The technology delivered. But the problem was that these stocks were discounting 20 years of growth. And if something happens in between that, look out below. So remember, no matter how exciting the technology is, and we're going to be talking a lot about that, don't get caught up in the idea of paying ridiculous multiples for these stocks because you could be sitting 10 years from now and still not have a profit. So we're very excited about the technology. We are looking at the areas which are going to benefit. Jim is going to give you the exact areas that we're investing in. We're very excited about it, but we're not excited about paying high prices for high multiple stocks. Now let's move into the next area which we're very excited about. We've been talking about this for three years, but it finally came about and we did very well in the stocks. We bought a lot of building stocks and uh, stocks that related to the building. They've all done very well. Some of them we've already sold, but we're in a couple of other areas. This is an area where we feel there's going to be a lot of potential. And if you look at the first chart, it shows that real estate still has a ways to go. This is called the affordability index. And you want to look at this index when you're looking at real estate because it tells you the potential. In other words, what is going to make real estate go up higher? If more and more people can afford to buy homes. If you were in a position where people couldn't afford to buy homes, then obviously the real estate market's not going to go up. This is the affordability index, and it was way up on a 35 to 40 year high. It's come down, but you can see that it is still at a 30-year high. So this is a very good sign that despite the fact that real estate's going up and there's a broad recovery going, there's still a lot of potential in there. And so that bodes well for the future of the real estate market and for those of you who own homes. And for those of you who have opportunity to invest in real estate, I would strongly recommend if it was bought at the right price, that is a place to be. It's one of the few asset classes that are still great values. And here is the Case-Shiller Index. Uh, I'm showing this to give you a perspective of where real estate was at the top of the market in 2006. You can see how it's bubbled along on the bottom here. And now it's got a very strong uptrend. And so it's got quite a ways to go. Well, we've covered some of the most exciting things in the economy. The low-cost energy fueled by breakthrough and natural gas fracturing manufacturing renaissance, and the real estate recovery. These trends are very good news, but our strategy is this. We want to study to see what's going on. We want to avoid those industries and stocks that are going to get hit by this technology because as good as this is if you're on the right side of the track, it can be devastating if you're on the wrong side. So we're studying to see which industry are going to benefit from it and which industries are going to be obsolete or not be as competitive. So we want to look at both sides and then we want to invest in those industries that benefit because the reduced cost is going to increase production, higher profits, and have a great ability to grow with a lot less risk. So those are the strategies that we're going to use and Jim is going to give you all the details on how we're going to do it later on in the session. Now let's look at some of the things that are concerning and they are very much of a concern and they're long-term problems. The first one is the unemployment problem. And you can see that this is the headline unemployment. Whenever they talk about an unemployment figure, this is the chart that they usually give you. Now if you look at this chart, it actually looks like it's getting better. 
I mean, the unemployment was down to 10%. It's now at 72 So that looks like a positive trend. Well, how do you reconcile that with the fact that there's so many people out of a job and so many people working part-time and they can't get a job? The way you reconcile it is this is not the whole story. This is just a headline story. Let me give you the whole story. The whole story you can see better in this next chart. And this shows you that the unemployment level is the highest in 30 years. This is a chart that measures the number of people that are available for work and the people that are working. Now, you can't get anything simpler than that. You got the number of people available and the number of people working, and that is the lowest in 30 years. And that is the problem today, and I'm going to show you how to reconcile those charts. Here is what we call the U6 unemployment. And that's what we spend our time thinking about more than any of the other two charts, because what this chart shows you is the math. And the math is there's 11 million people looking for a job, 11,255,000 to be exact. But there are 7,926,000 people who are working part-time because they can't get a full-time job. And so if you add those people up, and then you've got 3,219,000 people who are so discouraged from looking at a job, they've quit looking. What's really disturbing in the last month, 500,000 more people were added to the discouraged role. It went from 2.7 to 3.2. So that is a very big problem. And if you add it all up, you got 22,400,000 people out of work or underutilized as opposed to 11 million. And the unemployment rate is not 7.2, it is 13.1. And that is one of the highest numbers we've had in 30 to 40 years. And until that changes, you're not going to have a lot of growth in the economy, as I'm going to show you later. Now, the main theme that I want to emphasize throughout this seminar is that the real key to all the problems is jobs. And I'm going to show you later on how crucial that is. Because if we don't grow the economy and we don't create jobs, we don't have consumers, and consumers are 70% of the economy. So if you can fix something that's 70% of the economy, you've solved your problems, haven't you? So let's take a look at the job creation. That's the one thing every month I'm most concerned about. And in the last year, we've created 180,000 jobs per month. But in the last three months, it's dropped down to about 148,000. The last month, it was 145,000. Let me show you how long it would take to fix the unemployment problem at this rate. Let's say that we're creating 185,000 jobs a month. That's the figure that's been last year. It's slowing down, but let's just use the best number we got. There are 70,000 new people coming into the job market every month, so we are net creating 115,000 jobs. If you do that times 12, you got 1,385,000 jobs that we are creating. In order to get the unemployment down to normal levels, I figured it would take about 8,720,000 jobs. So in order to get that unemployment down to the normal levels where we have a strong economy, it take 8 million. At the current rate of 1.3 million, it's going to take us 6.3 years to fill that gap. If we grow at 145,000, which it did the last three months, at this rate, it would take 9.7 years. So this is a very long-term problem that needs to be solved by increased manufacturing, which hopefully is coming, and greater jobs. Now, there is one good sign going. In a dismal picture, there's some very positive signs, and this has just been recently in the last month. Take a look at this. This is the small business hiring plan. Now, the reason this is so important is companies that are less than 500 employees per company are the fastest growing companies. They're the ones that add the most jobs. They add between 60 to 80 percent of the new jobs in this country. So that's where the action is. And there's a survey by the Association of Small Businessmen, and they poll small business people all over the country, and they say, how many people do you plan on hiring? Well, this indicator has gone up. And it's up 9% this last month. It's up a little higher last month, but it's still up pretty good. 
So this is a very positive sign that if we can get the jobs hiring going and increase that production, it'll make a huge difference. Now, let me just say to you that while we're creating 145,000 to 180,000 jobs a year, in a good, strong economy from our economic recovery as we have, we should be able to do 250 to 300,000 jobs a month. And if we do, the figures of solving this problem goes from 6.3 or 9.7 at the worst to 3.2 years. So once we get the economy going and once these jobs start to come through, we can solve this problem in three years or less. And that is why the job picture is so important to everything we do. So that is one of the concerns. I want you to write this down because that's going to be with us until the job figures changes. We watch this very closely every month, and we'll keep you posted on that. The next major area of concern, which has been in the headlines all the time, and for good reason, is the federal debt. And this is my favorite quote, and this is why I include it in every conversation or seminar that I teach, because this is one of the major problems confronting everybody as an American. Doesn't matter what party you're in, this is affects everybody in America. Truth is not only violated by falsehood, it may be equally outraged by silence. The decline of all great nations started with too much debt, including the great Roman Empire, right to the present countries in Greece, Italy, Spain, and Portugal. You can't even believe what's going on in these countries. I'm going to show you that a little bit later. But that is one of the problems. Now look what happened to this country. Five years ago, the debt was nine trillion, it's now 17 trillion. 10 years ago, it was 6.8 trillion. It took us 200 years to get to six trillion in debt, 200 years. And it only took 10 years to take it from six trillion to 17 trillion. Now think about that. It doesn't matter what party you're involved in. This is something that is clearly unsustainable, and one of the things that it's not showing right now is the interest rates are so low, so the interest on the debt is only $241 billion. It's only a few percent. But if interest rates go up 1% more, adds $160 to $200 billion to the debt, our debt service could skyrocket, interest rates would go high, and we've had a lot of problems. So this is something that has to be taken care of and it has to be addressed, and I'm gonna show you a couple of ways that we could work our way out of this. Now, just to give you some relativity, you say, well, we, we have a $16.5 trillion economy, you have $16 trillion debt, what does that mean? Well, we now have as much debt as we have a GDP, total economic environment. We have 100% debt. Well, what does that mean? Usually when a country gets to 60 to 80 percent debt, that's a warning sign that it's gone too far. We're at 100 percent. So I made a study of 31 nations that filed bankruptcy or had to reorganize themselves under bankruptcy codes. 31 countries in the last 30 years. The average GDP was 69 percent. In other words, 70 percent was about as far as you can go. We're at 100 percent. Only five of those countries had a GDP, debt to GDP, higher than 100%. So you know that 100% is pushing the limit when only five countries got away with that, and the other ones were even at 69 or 70%. So this is a major concern. Now let me tell you what happens when a country goes too far in debt, and then people won't accept the debt and you have to restructure and you go through all the things that Greece, Portugal, and Spain have gone through. The first thing you get is high interest rates, which raises the cost of everything. 25% unemployment in these countries across the board. And among the youth, it's 40 to 50%. So you can see that, as you've been reading in the paper, there have been riots and strikes, and all kinds of civil disobedience because of what's happening to the public. Now, let me tell you what happened to the public. Their pensions, which were promised to them by the government, were cut 50 to 70 percent. 
So this would be like Social Security being cut 50 to 70 percent. I'm not projecting that that's going to happen, but that's what happened in these countries. They eliminated all kinds of services. There is just chaos in these countries, and no matter how much of a bailout they get, Greece is about ready for another bailout. And this just goes on and on. The suicide rate in Greece was the lowest in the world. It's now the highest. So if a nation doesn't meet their demands to get things in line, it's going to work out one way or another. And so these are the kind of situations you have. Now let's look at the main problem, which is the U.S. unfunded liabilities. You know, all of these government programs are great. They all help a lot of people, and we should have them. The question that I've always asked, who's going to pay for these things? How are we going to pay for all the things that the government wants to do for us? And I'm all for them. I'm not against them. I know that Social Security's helped a lot of people, Medicaid, uh, Medicare, all of them, Obamacare. But the question is, how do we pay for it? There's no argument about the fact that we should have them. The question is, how do we pay for it? Now, take a look at this. Sometimes the best intentions produce the worst results. And there's nothing that will show that better than these statistics. These are all good intentions. Look at the results. In 2003, our unfunded liabilities, which is Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, all the government programs, had a $39 trillion unfunded liability. That means we're going to have to come up with $39 trillion. I was so concerned about that in 2004 that I wrote an 88-page newsletter. 88 pages telling you about all these things, and I thought, it just can't go on anymore. How can we fund $39 trillion of unfunded liabilities? Well, in 2008, it went up to 65, and today it's 2013, it's 84 trillion, and I'm still scratching my head saying, I can't believe that we run up this kind of debt and we're still going. But somewhere along the line, something has to be done. Now, a lot of people feel that the way to solve this problem is to raise taxes, and especially on the wealthy. Why shouldn't the wealthy pay more? They're living so well, they've got all this money, and all these people are struggling with their medical insurance and so forth. Well, let's take a look at this and see if that's really realistic. Take a look at the 2,000 tax returns. This is the top 1%, 5, 10, and 25%. Now, if you look at the top 1%, they make $1.5 trillion. They pay $354 billion in taxes, which is 37% of the taxes. So the top 1% pays 37% of all the taxes. Now, let's just for sake of imagination, because you could never get away with it, you can raise them a little bit, but you're not going to raise them double. Let's just double their taxes. Let's just say, by golly, it's time to get our debts down to pay all these wonderful programs. Let's raise them $354 billion. If you took the top 1% and you doubled their taxes, and you took that $354 billion and paid it to the unfunded liabilities, it'd take you 200 years to pay it off. So obviously, that's going to not solve the problem because you probably can't even double their taxes. But if you could, it still would take 200 years. So on the right-hand column, I said, well, let's look at the corporations. They're so wealthy. They've got so much cash. They're making so much money. They're making $2. trillion dollars, and they're paying $418 billion in taxes. Let's just double the taxes on the corporation. So you double the tax on the corporation. You got $418 billion. It takes you 237 years to pay it off. So obviously, raising taxes is not going to solve the problem. It's a Band-Aid. It doesn't do anything. But here's the worst thing about raising taxes. And nobody talks about that. And this is what we call Hauser's Law. There was a very uh, good economist, money manager, who kind of put this idea all together. And it goes to show you what happens if you raise taxes. Now, believe it or not, after the war, the top marginal tax rate, that's the top rate that you pay on the top money you make, was almost 84 to 85%. It almost got as high as 90 at one time. 
and look at the federal government on the bottom. That's their revenue. You notice when the taxes were in the 90%, they didn't make any more money on the revenue they had. They made 20%. As the taxes has gone down, they're still only making 19%. So whether you raise the taxes to 90% at the top bracket or leave it where they are, the government is not going to make more than 19 to 20%. What is the reason for that? How could they not make more money if they're getting more in taxes? The reason is all this ingenuity, all of this brain power that creates the Apple and the Microsoft and the Nikes and all these Amazons, all these great companies, that kind of energy goes into saving money on taxes. So instead of building companies, they build tax shelters. They devise companies that lose money so they get tax breaks. They take this creativity and they bring it overseas and they invest overseas. They put it in tax shelters in foreign banks. They rush all over the world to try to cut their tax bracket down so they don't have to pay that much in taxes. And in so doing it, the productivity of this country goes down. We produce less goods. And even though the government gets a higher share of the profits, they make less money because their revenue goes down. So raising taxes, as you can see, even if you took the top 5%, is not going to solve the problem. Well, if that's the situation, what could solve the problem? What do we do? What is the best policy for this government to do? Well, let's take a look at Social Security. If you look at Social Security, it is based on the fact that the government runs out the statistics for 75 years, and then they present value it back, and so they say, over the next 75 years, we're going to collect this much, the economy is going to grow this much, we're going to collect, and we have this much in liability. And it's based on 2.2% growth in the economy. That is the good news, that at least one thing that the actuaries did is they used a very conservative growth rate, so if we grow faster than that, we can do a lot better. But let me give you just one caveat about economic projections. And I learned this from President Nixon. He wasn't the most admired president I had, but he had a couple of great insights, and this was one of them. I have found that my economic advisors are not always right, but they are always sure. <laughs> so the point is that when you look at economic projections by the government, you can almost count on the fact that they're not going to come in, and they're always going to be more rather than less. Let me give you an example. In 1963, they started off Medicare, and they projected that by 1990, the Medicare cost would be $99 billion. So in 1963, 30 years ahead, they said it'd be about $9 billion. The actual cost at that time was $67 billion. So it went from $9 billion to $67 billion. And this has been true of all of these different programs. But let me give you one thing that is a little bit encouraging. In 2003, there was a report out that said that Social Security projections, that they would be out of money by 2037. So that was the projection in 2003. Five years later, the projection showed that it was 10 years longer. So while it may not be the final solution, the real answer to this problem in Social Security, Medicare, and all of these government programs is that if you want to continue with these programs, you have to cut the costs now in the programs, and then you have to grow the economy. And the way you grow the economy is by giving entrepreneurs incentive to build businesses, to create products, and to create jobs, and that pushes everything forward. And if we were to do that, we would definitely have a chance of working our way out, and it's really our only hope. Let's go into the next section, which is the consumer debt. And here is some very good news. Now, while the government is continuing to pile up the debt, the consumer is actually liquidating their debt. They are saving more money. They're paying off their debt. Some of these uh, loans have gotten foreclosed on. You've had cars repossessed. There's been a lot of bankruptcy and so forth. But the bottom line of it is that the free enterprise system is working in that the consumer is learning their lesson, they're spending their money more wisely, and because of that, they've cut the debt to GDP, 
uh, by 97% to 80%. And that is an extraordinary achievement. We're not there at the level it should be, but we're way ahead of the game. And so this is a very positive trend. And what is the lesson of that? When people are accountable, when they lose their home if they don't pay their mortgage, when they lose their car if they don't pay their debt on their car, then they learn the lesson and then they do not get more credit because the credit agencies aren't going to extend it. What happens with the government? They run up more debt, they just raise the debt ceiling, and we just go on again. So unless they get together and not only raise the debt ceiling, but figure out a way to cut the budget, these problems are going to continue. Now, the next problem we're going to talk about, which is a very big problem into the future, and that is the Federal Reserve policy. Because of the recession, the gov government and the Federal Reserve has created a tremendous increase in their balance sheet. Some people call that printing money. I wouldn't exactly call it printing money because the money is not in circulation. As I'm going to show you, the money is actually going into the banks. But if this money was going into the economy, then of course you would be having high inflation and that's what everybody's worried about. But if you can see, this is the expansion of the money supply, and this is unprecedented in the 100-year history of the Federal Reserve. This is just extraordinary. Now, if you look at the next chart, you can see that as high as that curve is, that money is not going into the economy. That money is going into the banks. So the banks are getting a free ride. They're putting the money in, uh, they're creating the money and putting it in the bank. The banks landed out at 25 to 3% and they are making real good money, and they don't have to lend money to the consumer because they're making this without taking any risk. And a bank would rather have a risk-free loan than one with a little bit higher than loans. So what is going to solve this problem? As long as this money stays in the bank, you're not going to have high rates of inflation. But the minute it starts to circulate, you can have very high rates of inflation. Now. The rate of inflation can come up to you like a thief into the night. In the 70s, I'm going to give you an example. The Fed did the same thing, but they didn't take the money out. There's two things that the Fed can do. They can create this liquidity and get the economy going, and then they can slowly pull it out, as I'm going to show you Japan did, and then you don't have this high rate of inflation. But if you leave it in there, you're going to have high inflation. And this is a chart what happened in the 70s when I started century management in 1974. The inflation rate was running at 2.7%. And in a matter of two years, it went from 2.7 to 12. It was going up every month, and the stock market went down 45% in the big caps and 75% in the small cap. So this was one of the worst bear market in, since the Great Depression. And while I was in that field, I thought to myself, you know, things can't get much worse, and stocks are so cheap at five to eight times earnings. So I decided to start Century Management because I thought it was a great opportunity to be able to buy these stocks very cheap, and it turned out to be correct. But the feeling at that time was like the world is going to come to an end. I figured if the world comes to an end, it doesn't matter. And if it doesn't come to an end, I'm going to make a lot of money. So. That's the way to think about the value system. So what we have to do is we have to recognize that if the government is not going to pull this money back out, we're going to have high inflation, and we're going to have to deal with this. If they pull it out in time, then we can avoid this inflation. That's exactly what Japan did. Take a look at the chart on Japan. Japan had this huge run-up in bank reserves in the year 2000. And then a couple of years later, they pulled it right back out, and they avoided the entire rate of inflation. There's only one problem with that system, is that when they pulled the money out, the economy slowed down. And in the last five years, they've, only, they've had a minus 1.6% growth. The last 10 years, it's only been 0.56. And in the last 15 years, they've had zero growth. So what this did is they ran it up, they saved the inflation, but they had a very low growth rate. And look what happened to their stock market. It's still down 63% from the 89 peak. 
and it's taken 24 years and it still hasn't recovered. So if we're going to pull the money out, it's going to be done in a very slow method used because if it isn't done properly, we could have a very slow growth. We may not have a lot of inflation, but have a slow growth and it would be difficult to grow the economy. So to summarize it, we've got two approaches. If you leave it in, we have to worry about inflation. If they pull it out too fast, we could have recessions or slow growth. And that is the crisis right now that the Federal Reserve finds themselves in. And there's a lot of people feel that it can be done. I've talked to people who've spent 20 years on the Federal Reserve. They feel we could pull this money out gradually, but if they overstay, we're going to have a lot more inflation than we've ever had in the past. Now look at what the Japanese are doing, and this is a real concern. Here is a nation whose culture did not believe in printing money, and now they're doing it more than anybody else because they have had a lost decade. They want to make up for it, and they are creating this kind of uh, money printing, and that's not only going on in Japan, that's going all over the world and in the United States. So there is going to be a day of reckoning for some of this. We really have to be prepared for this because if it pulls back too fast, we've got some serious problems. Now, let's talk about inflation. A lot of people say, well, if the government created all this money, how come we haven't had inflation? So the CPI says that we've only had inflation of 2.4%. How many people have had more than 2.4% of inflation in the audience here. Can you raise your hand? Look at your hands, right? Don't be shy. Okay, so you can look around the room and see that most people have experienced a lot more inflation than 2.4%. So what is the problem? Is the CPI wrong or what's going on? Well, you can question the CPI as I have for many years and I watch it very closely, but after doing a lot of study, I don't think the CPI is wrong a lot. It may be understating it, but what it happens is over the long run it sort of catches up, but in the short run it could understate it by 2% or more, and I think that's what's happened in the last few years. Now, the, fortunately, there's a way of checking that. There is an institute called the in American Institute of Economic Research, and they have an independent, non-government agency that follows all the costs and it's called the Everyday Pricing Index, and you can see it on the chart, that's the top figure, and you can see that the CPI is here, and the, and the Everyday Pricing Index is there, so you can see that that is a lot more inflation than the CPI shows. Now, one of the reasons is, is the way they weigh it. In the EPI, the Everyday Pricing Index, they don't show any cost for housing, because they're only doing everyday pricing, something that you spend at the grocery store, that you buy your clothes, things that you do on an everyday basis. The long-term trends of housing and car purchases are over a longer period, and so they kind of move that aside. The CPI does all of these things, and the housing has been very depressed for the last five or six years, so that has dragged the CPI down. But once the housing starts to move and it gets filled to through the CPI, it's going to play catch up and I think you're going to see a CPI that's much higher. Now let's take a look at the real inflation. The CPI says that for the last five years we've only had 1.3 and in the last 10 years 2.4. If you look at the EPI, it says 0.7 over the last five years but 0.4 over the last 10 years. If you take commodities, which are a good way to look at inflation because these are all the raw materials, they have gone up 6.4%. And if you look at agriculture products, they've gone up 5.9%. So if I take that as an average, I think the average inflation rate in the last 10 years is closer to 4.68% than it is than the 2.4%. And I think the CPI is understating it. If you look at gold, it's up 14%, oil and gas is up 13%, hospital service up 5.9%. The only things that are down is the housing, which is 30% of the index, and apparel and auto. So most of the things are much higher except those two factors, 
And I think that the reason that the CPI is so lagging is because housing is 32% of the index, and then there's another 10% that is due to the fuel and things that go into housing. So basically, housing is almost 41% of the CPI index, and when that starts to move up, you're going to see much higher inflation. So when you look at all these problems, and you look at the good things that are going on, and you look at the problems that we have to face, you say, how do you invest in this kind of an environment? What do we do? Well, I want to remind you that we've always had problems in this country, and since I've been in business the last 40 to 45 years, we've had three terrorist attacks, 27 military campaigns, five Republican presidents, three Democratic presidents, six recessions, six worldwide currency problems, 20 major companies going bankrupt, 35 notable natural disasters. Oil price is going from three to 145 and so forth. So as you can see, this country has always had problems, and the way you invest in that is to invest in assets that benefit from the growth of the economy, which eventually comes. And you can see on this chart here, I've listed all of the different stocks and bonds and all of the different asset classes, and you can see that during this whole period, stocks have gone up 11%. Our company has made 14% over the long term, 8.8% in long term US Treasury, 7% in business real estate, and down the line. So if you look at what to invest in, you can see that if you buy common stocks at the right price, it is the best investment you could make compared to all other asset classes, even though those asset classes have done good and can even do better if you buy them at the right time. So let's review the asset classes and see where we are. If you look at the long-term bonds, the bond rate has gone down to almost a 60 to 70 year low. So that means that over the long run, if we have more inflation and higher interest rates, those bonds are all gonna go down. I can't think of any asset class over the next 10 years that is gonna do worse than bonds. And it is for this reason that in our bond funds and in our uh, bond portfolios, we're all in short-term papers so that if the bond market goes down, we'll be able to roll that cash into higher yielding securities and it'll be also short-term until we really get down to the place it should be. Now let me give you some idea of where bond rates are gonna go. Usually bonds sell at 3% over the inflation rate. So if you got an inflation rate of 3%, then your bonds are gonna sell about 6%. If you have an inflation rate of 4%, you're gonna have bonds at seven to 9%. And if you have an inflation rate of seven to 10%, you're gonna have bonds at 10 or 13%. Now I can't predict what it's gonna be, but I can tell you the inflation and the interest rates are gonna be much higher in the next 10 years. I'm not so sure about the next two or three years because there's still a lot of slack in the economy, so they probably could be okay for the next couple of years, but I don't want to take that chance in being long-term unless it's just certain portfolios because of the fact that there's so much risk on the downside over the long run. So over the long run, I predict that if you're holding long-term bonds over the next 10 to 12 years, there could be losses as high as 40 to 50%. So that's not an area where we want to be, especially on the long side. We do want to be in the shorter term bonds that give us the liquidity and give us a return. And as the rates go up, we will reinvest them at higher rates. Now, the next asset class I want to talk about is cash. And many people ask us about this because the market's going up and we're in about 23% cash. And the reason is that when we buy at the buy point, when it gets at the sell point, we sell it irrespective of whether the market's going up or not. That is the discipline. And if we stick to this discipline, we'll always be able to make good returns irrespective of what's happened. And I showed you all of the things that happened in the past, and we've always been able to make money over the long term because we use the discipline of buying it right, having the reward to risk in our favor. Now, you say, well, if we're sitting 23% in cash and we're not making any money in the cash, we're not making any money. Well, that's not the way to look at it. The way I look at it and the way we look at it in century management is, if we're looking at a stock 
We started to buy one stock. I don't want to mention it because we're not entirely through with the purchase, and I want everybody to be able to get a fair price. But we've been looking at a stock that was at $215 just six months ago, and we were able to buy it at $174 the other day. Now, being in cash allowed us to buy that stock at $174 instead of $215. Now, that is a lot better value. No matter what happens, if the stock turns out to be a bad stock and we lose money, we lose about 20% less. But if it goes up, we make 20% more. So the idea of buying stocks and waiting for the opportunity, it's not that we're not making any money in the cash. The cash is allowing us to buy it cheaper and get us a return. And sometimes you can get that return in a couple of months because the stock goes down, it recovers, and then it's on its way up. So the important thing is that we use cash as a portfolio tool to be able to wait for those opportunities, and they always come. I've been in this business for 45 years. I've never seen a year where there hasn't been some kind of a shakeout where you can't pick up a stock or a couple of stocks or even 10 stocks cheaper than what it was at the top of the market. So we are using the cash to reduce the risk, to be able to buy at lower prices, and then to create the opportunity. OK, let's move on to the next section, which is the gold section. Now, because of the long-term potential of inflation, we have decided to use gold as an asset class. And we're going to review that with great length. There have been debates about what the price of gold should be for hundreds of years. I started off in the 70s. We were lucky to be able to get in on gold when it was freely traded the first time, August 15, 1971. And so we were able to make a lot of money. That was the first good hit I made as an investment counselor. And we did real well with gold. But gold was at $40. It's a different price today. And the methodology that we used at that time was, I would say, it was more luck than methodology because gold was so depressed you could almost not help make money. But that's not the way the situation is today. You have to buy gold at the right price, or you could have an asset that's not making you any money for a long time. Now, these disagreements have been going on for many years, and here's the reason. Some people feel that gold is money, and some people feel it's just a commodity. And you can debate this. But let me just get show you back into the 1836 with Baron Rothschild. He was the Warren Buffett of that era. And he said, there's only two people who truly understand the price of gold. One is a director in the Bank of England. The other one is an obscure clerk in the Bank of France. Unfortunately, they disagree. So that has been the problem with gold for hundreds of years. Now, we decided to use the methodology that we use as value investors to put a price on the price of gold. And I think we found a pretty good methodology that will give us a reasonable entry point. Here's what we did. The first thing we did is we, we know that gold is traded for 40 years, so the market price works out what it is worth at different price. So what we did is we took gold in 1971, and we inflation adjusted and said, OK, if it was $650 in 1982, what is it worth today? So we took the inflation adjusted approach. Then we took the actual cost of producing. We've talked to gold miners. We've talked to people who do the accounting in gold. And we've read all the reports by the Gold Council. And so what we came up with is we know that whatever the cost of producing gold, which is about $1,100 to $1,200, called the marginal cost of gold, that is the actual cost of producing an ounce of gold. So we use that as a methodology. And then we use the relationship between gold and oil. And there's been an amazing relationship between oil and gold that's held for 70 to 80 years. Uh, we use gold versus the CRB metals. That's all the commodities, the metals. We used it against home prices, and we used it against the CPI. And the National Bureau of Economics just did a report where they hired commodity traders and economists, and they tried to figure out what a methodology to use for gold, and they used the CPI. They, divide, they took gold and divided it, or put the CPI and divided by gold and the ratio, and we have included that in our statistics. And here are the results of the statistics. At the peak, Using all those relationships, we're coming up with 1,900 to 2,200. 
the fair value about what it should be trading on is about 1150 to 1300 the buy point is about 800 to 1000 and the worst case as low as we can conceivably see it is about 6 to 700 so when it gets into the 800 range you've got a good price to buy you never want to pay more than 1150 to 1300 because that's Basically, you just have a flat line. You wouldn't make much money, but it's certainly worth that. Now, let me show you on the inflation charts how we did that. This is only one of six methodologies. We don't have the time to go through all of them, and you probably wouldn't want to hear all of them anyway, but we'll go through the first one. This, to me, is a very valid methodology. I've done this with many commodities, including oil, and it's a very good way to do it. In 1982, gold was selling at three and a quarter, and if we inflation adjust it, it's at 715. If we do the 285, uh, the inflation adjusted is about 715. So you look at the bottoms and you can see that 300 is about the bottom. And if you inflation adjust it, it's around 650 to 700. That's our worst case. If you look at the midpoint, the fair value, it's around $509, that's that little peak there in 83, and then we ran that doubt down, and that came out to about 1,200. So the midpoint is about 1,200, and then we inflation adjusted the peak in 1980 at 860 and ran it out. It came out to 2555. We took a more reasonable peak in 1980 at 711. It came out about 1,900. So you can see the upside is about 1,900 to 2,500. The downside is about six to 700, buy point of eight to 100 to 1,000. And we've actually started to invest in the gold mining stocks. And that is an anticipation of the prices that we expect. And the purchases are based on this model. So now let's look at the next chart, which is the raw commodities, which is inflation. Now, if you look, if you wanted to use one guide to figure out how to hedge yourself against inflation, you could use raw commodities because raw commodities are always going to reflect the depreciation in the dollar and the increase in the commodities. And if you started that in 71 when the dollar was detached from gold, which is the inflationary period, you go up to the peak, it goes up about five times. So in the last 40 years, if you would have bought commodities, they would have gone up five times your money. So that would have been a good way of protecting against inflation. And we are, in fact, using that and are starting to buy some of these companies that have low cost producer and commodity. Now, to remind you again of why stocks go up more than almost any other class, no matter what goes on, I'm going to give you the reasons. The first thing is, if you invested in commodities, it would go up five times. But if you invest it in stocks, the chart shows that the commodities are on the bottom. They went up five times, but stocks went up 15 times. The Dow went from 1,000 to 15,000, while the CRB index went from 100 to 500. So how do you account for the fact that stocks perform so much better than the raw commodities when the raw commodities are really reflecting inflation? That is always a question that I have thought about, and I can give you the answers. One of the reasons is that raw commodities reflect inflation, and stocks reflect the increase in inflation and the human ingenuity, the technology. And that is so great that when you combine commodities, which stocks own, they own inventory, they own real estate, they own plant and equipment. So stocks have commodities in them, but they also have human ingenuity. And this human ingenuity is so great that when you combine it with the capital and the commodities, you have an increase of three to one over what the commodities did. And just to give you a couple of examples of that, you've all used Apple and used their products. That was started in a garage by two men with an idea. They created 80,000 employees and Apple people are 600,000 worldwide that are connected with the Apple Corporation. Not necessarily working with Apple directly, but indirectly working with Apple. So here you have a guy who created a half a trillion dollars of wealth out of nothing but an idea, 
and use the commodities and the capital to create this kind of wealth. And that is the history and story of America. And then you take Jeff Bezos, he employs 88,000 people, probably has hundreds of thousands of people connected with it, created $142 billion of market cap of wealth out of, again, nothing. There's a Latin expression called ex nihilo, out of nothing. It's the only Latin word I know, but it's one of my favorite. <laughs> Bill Gates, 100,000 people, 290 billion in market cap, and Mary Kay Ash started Mary Kay Cosmetic on a kitchen table, part-time as a mother, 45,000 in people, 3 billion in sales. This is the reason why proper investment in stocks always yield a greater return than commodities, even though they are showing, uh, even though commodities have a great return, when you combine it with the human ingenuity, that is where you get your bang for your buck, and that's where you want to do it. But I want to caution you, you have to buy stocks at the right price, because if you buy them at the wrong price, just like in the technology bubble, it could go against you and you could lose money. So it's not a guarantee that you're going to, even if you use the best vehicle, that you're going to make money. It's got to be bought in the right price. And I want to give you a couple of examples of that. This is an overvalued market. This is where I started in the business. And this market didn't go any worse for 16 years because of the fact that it was so overvalued. Now look what happened. During that time, I've drawn a value zone, and if you would have bought stocks in the value zone, and when we started in 74, we did, you can make a lot of money. There were seven or eight trading opportunities, 30% each, in a market that really went nowhere. So if you buy the individual stocks, even in an overvalued market, you can make money over the long run if you stick to the discipline by buying in the value zone. Now I'm going to give you another example of a terrible thing that happened. It was one of the worst things that happened to America. It was the bombing of Pearl Harbor in December 7. Can you imagine anything worse than losing a big part of your fleet, getting dragged into a World War II that you weren't prepared for, and having all the dislocations of, uh, of a major attacks like that? And look what happened to the stock market. The stock market was so cheap that even with this catastrophic event, it dropped 18%. And during the whole war, during the whole five-year war, even a term when it didn't look like America was doing too well, that market continued to go up and went up an average of 14%. And what is the answer to that? If that would have been an overvalued market, it would have dropped 50%. It would have been down for years. But because it was so cheap, people could buy in there despite all of the problems, and they still made a lot of money. So in closing, I want to say one thing. We have covered the positive trends. We've covered the areas of concern. We're going to show you the investment opportunity in the market today. Our major concern is the Federal Reserve with the inflation situation, and that is something that we have to be very careful of. Now let me show you the final chart, which is my favorite chart. I always show it in every seminar, and it shows you what Americans really do, and you all deserve a hand for this, because this shows you the wealth increase over the last 60 years in America. We have gone from less than $1 trillion in wealth to $74 trillion. We hit a peak before the recession at $69 trillion. We dropped the 55 trillion, and with all the problems going on, with all the problems in the government and the economy, the American people's wealth after debt is at a record high. That is productivity, and that is the ingenuity of America. And if we give the money to the public and let them reinvest it instead of giving it to the government, then we're going to get this kind of results. They're going to create jobs and take care of all the problems that we need to do through jobs. And let me tell you why that is. We can't predict the future, but if we invest with discipline, we create the future. We can figure out the way to make money irrespective of what happens, and by doing that, we create our own future. We can't, we can't tax our way out of debt, but we can grow our way out of debt. This means doing what America has always done best. Encourage creativity, innovation, entrepreneurship.
Create products and services that are the best in the world. Develop new business that create jobs. And like I said to you before, jobs is the key to everything, and I'm going to show you why now. Jobs help pay the taxes. Jobs help pay for social security and social program. Job creates money for consumers so they can grow the economy, and if we grow the economy 1% more, then we are able to take care of our debt. And most important of all, jobs create people who are independent and who have character. And it is what makes the key to creating job. Hardworking people willing to invest and take risks. This, for this reason, and this reason alone, creating jobs is the best social program in the world. Thank you very much. Thank you, brother. Thank you. All right, well, I hope everybody's enjoyed the program so far. And now it's time to move on to the second part of our presentation, and we're going to bring up our senior portfolio manager, Steve Shipman. Steve has been with our firm for four years. He has 27 years of industry experience. But we have been working with Steve uh, for about 20 of those years. When we were back in uh, Los Angeles, Arnold used to meet with Steve and Sam Hale and a few other gentlemen and talk about investment philosophy and ideas and, and what have you. So we really feel like he's been part of our team uh, for many more years beyond the four years uh, that he's officially been with us. So as a senior portfolio manager, uh, Steve meets with uh, Jim and Arnold every day in the portfolio manager meetings. These on typical days are two to three hour meetings talking about the strategies and reviewing the, the different buy and sell decisions uh, that are made in your portfolio on a daily basis. And for those of you that have had a chance to talk with Steve, you also know that he is uh, truly a market historian uh, and a key member uh, of our team. So now if you'll join me in welcoming Steve Shipman. Uh, thank you, Scott. Um, you know, Arnie started this morning by uh, thank you for being here. I'm going to start by thanking you for staying here. <laughs> he is a tough act to follow in, in many ways. And uh, one of the ways in, is how he spends his time, not just following him in speech. And today I have an example for you of the kind of guy Arnie really is, and that is uh, with us are 13 students from Texas Lutheran University who he invited uh, to attend and who he's been working with for the last uh, couple of years, educating and getting them induced into the value philosophy so that they in the future will be um, Arnold Vandenberg. So all the gentlemen and ladies that are here, would you raise your hand from Texas Lutheran and welcome and thank you for coming. We expect stock picks right away. Um, the idea for my part of the presentation actually comes from a um, <clears throat> discussion, a good discussion that we had with a long-term client who had noted that we have had uh, better than market returns over the years and with less risk, but was asking whether or not we shouldn't have had more return or less risk. And I think it's a good and legitimate question, and that's some of the aspect of uh, my presentation today, which is to go over uh, the elements of return in our portfolio, but even more importantly, to discuss with you how we look at risk and volatility, because it's a little bit different than the way that the market does. Uh, if we look at the last 39 years of our history, the firm has generated uh, better returns, but even more importantly, more consistent, more predictable returns than the marketplace has in general. If we look at those first 39 years, uh, note a couple of things in the chart that we're showing. Uh, the first is that the century management returns are very much concentrated around those middle of the charts. You can see a 10 to 15 percent return. Those returns have happened about 28 percent of the time. Uh, secondly, 
If you look closely at the chart, you'll also notice that over 70% of the time, the returns from the century management portfolio have been 10% uh, or more. And finally, if you look at the downside of the chart, those years where there were losses, there were only four so far in the last 40 years, almost 40 years, or 10% of the time, and only one time uh, was that loss more than 10%. Now, if we compare the outcomes of the century management portfolio to the S&P, we find something very different. Uh, unlike the returns of the century management portfolio that are concentrated around the middle part of the graph, that 10 to 15 percent, the market returns have been aggregated along the edges. You can see that about 18% of the time, you could get fairly big returns from the market, 30% plus. But also 18% of the time, you could get losses. So the amount of time that the market spends in the loss category versus uh, uh, century management is about twice as long. If we look even closer at the loss side of the ledger of the S&P's returns, you'll notice that those losses are actually concentrated on the greater end of the, of the returns. Over 8% of the time, the losses in the market, in the market portfolio, exceed 10%. That's one out of every 12 years. And another 8% of the time, the losses in the market are somewhere between minus 5 and minus 10%. If I line the two portfolios together, so we're looking at both Century Management and the S&P 500, it becomes very obvious that the Century Management portfolio has uh, less erratic outcomes, more predictable returns, and less frequent losses than the market does. And that's despite the fact that our portfolios have had, as you know, a good smattering of small cap and mid cap stocks. So the question becomes, how can that happen? Our answer is, it lies in our investment philosophy, the value philosophy. We truly evaluate stocks as discrete businesses, and we will only buy those businesses when we think that we have a good enough deal to protect to the downside, no matter what adverse outcome there might be. It's our experience that the intrinsic value of the business doesn't change very much, although the price of the stock changes a lot. We call that process identifying value gaps, and all of you who were here last year uh, heard Jim give quite a discussion on what that value gap is and what that means to us. Uh, for those of you who weren't here last year or would like to review that, it's on our website, and please review it at your leisure. So you can buy the 500 companies of the S&P, but you have to take the prices that Mr. Market gives you. Sometimes he'll give you companies that are overvalued, and sometimes he'll give you companies that are undervalued. But none of these are handpicked because they offer the margin of safety that we find necessary to protect from the permanent loss of capital. That's our definition of risk avoiding the permanent loss of capital. That's the hallmark of true absolute value investing. And paradoxically, by sticking to that discipline, uh, not only will you preserve that loss of capital, but over a reasonable period of time, you should also have a pretty handy outperformance. Now, Fundamental to knowing how to avoid that permanent loss of capital is being able to distinguish between the difference, uh, the difference between risk and volatility. Uh, most institutional investors and most advisors to high net worth individuals like yourself uh, describe risk as how much does the return swing around the average. And as we saw in the S&P 500 chart that was up, that S&P 500 swings pretty wildly, about 36% of the time. Now, in contrast, let's look at the nature of risk and volatility within the framework of the value philosophy, especially as we practice it at Century Management. 
uh, we find there's at least four significant triggers of what I would call macro sources of risk. That is, risks that are uh, outside of the company's control, risk that's coming from the external environment or the economic environment. First, there's changing technology. Uh, innovation happens, and it's the hallmark of the capitalistic societies. Arnie talked about some of those innovations that are forthcoming, and Jim, in the upcoming uh, discussion, will also talk about those innovations and how they play in our portfolio today. But just think about changes of technology in my lifetime in the computer industry. Uh, we saw mainframes give way to mini computers, and mini computers give way to PCs, and now PCs are giving way to tablets and to smartphones. The second uh, macro source of risk is competition. Entrepreneurs figure out how to do things better and cheaper. And if they abound, so does competition. Think about the once mighty five and dime stores that succumbed to the department stores that gave way to the specialty stores that are now in a fight for their life against Amazon and all the internet companies. Or just think internationally. When I was growing up in the 60s, people sneered at Japanese automobiles. Now they're top of the heap, yet they're being chased by the Koreans. A third source of macro risk to any company are natural disasters. From time to time, they can truly wipe out a business. Most recently, we saw some torrential, once-in-a-lifetime floods wipe out parts of Thailand and with that disrupting one of our businesses and many of the businesses that they served. And finally, there's government regulation. Uh, let me cite two and go first to Sarbanes-Oxley, which many of you may have remembered in 2002, uh, initiated because of the malfeasance of Enron. And during that time, you saw the market fall 20% in six weeks from the middle of June to the uh, end of July. Most recently, we've seen the uh, a similar malfeasance by some financial companies back in 2007, 2008, bring on another regulatory blunderbuss, the Dodd-Frank Act, which was signed into law in 2010. We're just beginning to understand uh, what that means to have the federal government micromanage the financial industry. Now, in addition to these macro sources of risk, again, uh, risks that are outside the control of the company. There are a couple of other elements uh, of risk that are inside or internal or intrinsic to the company. And I would say, I, I label those micro uh, levels of risk. And there are at least two major micro levels of risk that we take into consideration and evaluate at Century Management very seriously. You've often heard us talk about companies that take on excessive debt and the economic jeopardy that that places them in. How many times have we heard the story of companies that get complacent about their business and try to eke out additional meager profits by jimming up their balance sheet only to find out that they take a turn in business and get out of uh, and, and lose their business? Uh, usually it's not the sales volume decline that kills that business. Usually it's the required debt payment. The second internal source of risk that we examine in a business is associated with the management of the company. Sometimes the managers will put their business at risk, wittingly or unwittingly. Sometimes they fail to execute their business plan. Sometimes they seek grandeur by acquisitions and mergers. Sometimes they're just incompetent, but they do represent a serious form of risk to the business. So these are the things that we look at at Century Management as defining risk, not the variability of our expected returns, but what can sink the business. Risk has nothing to do with those variability of returns. Now, as opposed to risk, which is a threatening condition to investing. Let's talk a little bit about volatility, which we actually think is a friend of the value investment process. We see volatility as opportunity. 
And we define volatility simply as the movement of stocks around the intrinsic value of the business. So by this definition, volatility occurs both when the price of stock falls and creates a buying opportunity for us, or when the stock rises and creates a selling opportunity. Now, what can cause these extreme actions of prices? We know that investor psychology and emotions fuel some of that price action, and we know that the intrinsic value of the businesses don't change that much. So let's look at some of these uh, sources of volatility, and I'm going to break them down in the same way I did risk, macro and micro. When we look at the uh, macro sources of volatility, I can identify at least four elements. The first cause of price dislocation can occur when there's uh, an announced change of tax policy. Sometimes that comes from the executive branch, sometimes it comes from the legislative branch, but no matter where it originates, if it looks like there is going to be a change in the status quo, that will have an effect on prices. The second source of volatility in terms of price dislocation will happen from a change or an expected change in Fed policy. Uh, this has been particularly acute recently, as you know from the headlines with the Fed talking about its tapering policy and the changes that are involved in that. Thirdly, geopolitical events can cause volatility. Most recently we saw this a couple of months back when there was some concern that the United States was going to get involved in an effort to attack Syria. And finally, uh, there is uh, very often changes in prices when there are changed expectations about the growth of the economy. We saw this most recently in 2011 uh, during the Greek crisis and uh, the European events where many investors here in the United States thought that that would leak over into our borders and cause a recession. Now, depending upon the extent uh, of these particular changes, any or all of them uh, could cause fluctuating prices that create opportunities for us. The important thing to consider is not the magnitude of the changes that we see in the prices of these stocks. The important thing to consider is because the intrinsic value of the businesses don't change very much, we get a chance to buy and invest our monies in, the, in these companies. Now, in addition to the macro sources of volatility, there are also a couple of micro sources or sources that are endemic, intrinsic to the companies themselves. And let me run through a couple of those very quickly. Uh, one is uh, prices in a stock will change when there is a surprise to the earnings or they disappoint with their earnings. Or more recently, what's happened is companies guide the street about their sales or about their earnings being higher or lower. Any disappointment there can cause a temporary uh, change in price. Another source of uh, micro volatility will come from an expected change in the growth rate of a company's earnings. Now I'll use an example of our typical small cap cyclical stock. We're usually not buying these on the basis of earnings because there aren't any, but we can buy them on the basis of assets. The potential gains are modest at best, as you see in this uh, PE uh, example, where we'll stretch from somewhere from seven to, to nine or 10. However, when the prospects of a company's earnings improve, as you can see, so will their PE. Just small changes in expected earnings increases can lead to very large changes in PE multiples. And of course, the opposite is true. As soon as the companies hit their cyclical peak, and start to go the other way, investors will reduce their expectations. Third source of volatility when it comes to stock price changes are product failures or successes. Uh, think recently about the Apple iPod and the Apple iPad announcements and what that does to the price of Apple stock. And of course, those of you who are old enough to remember, I was the Edsel, um, there's a great source of product failure. A fourth source of volatility of stock prices is the death of a founder or the death of a very competent, capable CEO. Or, of course, the opposite is true. 
and that is you have a company that is languishing and a competent CEO joins the company offering hope and opportunity. We think we have one of those in your portfolio with a company called Lane Christensen. And we had a great experience with the CEO that you see uh, in the picture, uh, Rene Robichaud, who turned around a company that we had in our previous portfolios, NS Steel. Uh, now that he's at the helm of Lane, we think he has a great opportunity to do just the same. The final source of volatility in stock prices comes from the government again, a government investigation or a lawsuit. Uh, sometimes they will announce that there's an inquiry. Most recently, for instance, the Justice Department has been using the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, a piece of legislation passed in the 70s, uh, to go after companies and extract revenue for the government. So whether or not these exaggerated price swings happen because of a macro event or they happen because of some micro event, these are occasions that create opportunities for us and we want to take advantage of them. Now, we've talked about some of the elements of return, about some of the elements of risk and volatility. We have an investment process, we think, that tries to make money in all markets. And so the discipline that we have allows us to focus on the intrinsic value of the companies and ignore the emotional day-to-day -day swings of the general marketplace and investor psychology. That's the secret to the value investing proposition. Now, in the next part of the presentation, my colleague Jim will talk about another important aspect of investing with a margin of safety, and that is how to avoid value traps. So, Jim, I leave it to you. Well, thank you for joining us. Uh, I appreciate uh, everybody coming. It gives us a chance in research to see all of you that we generally see only once a year. So it's nice to, to uh, reconnect and, and uh, say hi. Uh, so hi. Uh, last year, I spoke in detail about our investment process and how we identify and capitalize on what we call value gaps. Uh, today, I'm going to quickly review the value gap uh, because it provides uh, the proper background for the main subject of my uh, talk today, and that is recognizing structural shifts and how that, imp uh, how that uh, impacts our investment process. So we, you've often heard us talk about themes in the past, and we have done it in, in general terms for the most part, but today I'm going to dig through uh, three structural shifts that we've recognized, uh, the themes that are associated with those structural shifts, and then I'll relate that to several portfolio holdings uh, that we have in all your accounts. Uh, so now for the refresher. Last, last year I spoke about the importance of having a methodology or a framework uh, for knowing when to buy and sell stocks. We talked about and walked through the, our HMA, our, the, the process that we use, how we look at a worst case analysis, formulate a worst case uh, price, a buy point, a sell point. And, I, and we use this, uh, the way I did it is illustrated this process by using a series of slides. Uh, which was designed uh, to show how our process is designed to capture those value gaps. It allows us to capitalize when the price of a stock becomes disconnected with the underlying value of the business. In those slides, I used Apogee Enterprises as the example company, which we'll do again today. In our process, we have 14 valuation metrics that we use, uh, but today I'm going to isolate just on one, and that is tangible book value and the price to tangible book value. There may be some that uh, aren't familiar with the term, so let's review that uh, quickly. If we start with the total assets of a company and then subtract the total liabilities, we end up with book value, also uh, referred to as uh, shareholder equity. From that, if we subtract off all the intangibles, which is goodwill, trademarks, and, uh, and patents, we'll arrive at tangible book value. If you take tangible book value, divide it by all the shares outstanding, you end up with tangible book value per share. So we look at uh, tangible book as a very good proxy for the underlying value of the business over time. It doesn't equate to the intrinsic value of the business, but it's a great measure um, as to, or, or a gauge to the growth of the business uh, and the direction of the underlying value. So here we look at uh, a graph of tangible book. Uh, from Apogee Enterprises from 1990 to present. And we can see that while 
Apogee is somewhat cyclical over time. It's grown quite nicely over the last several decades, and with each peak uh, being higher than the previous peak. On this next slide, we see the price of Apogee Enterprises for the same time period. And we can see that the price is far more volatile than, than the underlying business. It's gone from 5 to 30, back down to 5, up to 30, down to 10, back up to 30. And you can see it's far more volatile than your underlying business when we compare it to the book value in this next chart. So here, uh, not only do we see that the price moves up and down more significantly than the underlying value of the business does, but it does so more frequently as well. It's these wide and frequent price moves, also known as volatility, that gets investors so nervous. However, when we look at it very closely, we, we can see that it doesn't matter how scary the economy is or how ugly the headlines are or how nervous investors are. Every time Apogee hits one times book, one times tangible book, during times of maximum pessimism, it's the bottom. Here, we combine both the price and tangible book into a ratio. By doing so, we're comparing the price of the, of the company to the underlying value over time. So at the bottom, we see, again, Apogee is selling at one times tangible book, which is labeled the value zone. At the peak, it sells at three to four times book, which we've labeled the expensive zone. So by evaluating price in combination with value, we can see volatility isn't something to be feared, but can be something we can cheer. So why would we cheer it? Well, because when people are more concerned about price than they are value, when a price declines, they end up selling a stock irregardless of when it becomes a great value. Well, basically, they're handing us a gift. On the flip side, though, when everything's rosy and everything's looking up, these same investors pile into the stock, driving the stock up to the higher levels, at which point we're very happy to sell it to them. So you can see, at this point, not only did they hand us a gift at the bottom, they were gracious enough to double that favor and buy it from us at the top at a premium price. Now, if that's not something to cheer about, I don't know what is. Okay, so now let's move on to the main subject of today, of my conversation today, and that is understanding structural shifts and the impact that this has on companies. So it's one thing to understand the current value of the business, and we use history as a guide, but we also want to understand the future of the business. So we have to assess what is going to happen to the future of that company and that industry. Uh, and in order to do so, we look at structural shifts. So we know that the dynamics of world economies, regulation, competition, and the ingenuity of the human spirit are all subject to, to dramatic shifts and dramatic change. This leads to structural shifts, which then reshapes economies, reshapes industries, reshapes companies. And with that, within that, we're looking for those game-changing events. Because in that event, the winners will grow in excess of GDP while the losers decline. So recognizing these structural shifts, we develop themes. From those themes, we look through the winners and losers and buy companies. We want to, of course, look for those that are going to win and avoid those that will lose. Determining these winners and losers, of course, uh, has a dramatic and direct influence on the future prospects of industries and companies, such that the winners will gain competitive advantage, they'll see increased revenues, increased profits, and their asset prices will rise, while the losers will have a weakened competitive position, they'll lose market share, revenues and margins decline, as will their asset prices. The implications on the valuation in total uh, are also profound. In this next chart, we see a typical company where the stock price moves up and down in, uh, through a, a rather consistent valuation band, much like the Apogee Enterprises, selling at one times tangible book at the bottom and three to four times tangible book at the top. In that case, and with Apogee, there's no real structural shift in the business, so the stock will move up and down relative to the valuation band throughout an economic cycle. On this next chart, however, we see what happens when a company wins the structural battles. Not only do they see the rising profits gaining market share, but the entire valuation structure moves higher. So you've heard us talk about trying to find the next bull market and that, that that's what we're in search of. Well, this is the picture that I have in mind when we're saying we're looking for the next bull market. The opposite, of course, is true for the losers. Not only do they see declining fundamentals, but their entire valuation structure moves lower and lower. So you see declining fundamentals and declining multiples as well. This is also known as the value trap. 
and certainly something we try to avoid like the plague. When looking at the sources of structural shifts, we have found that they are generally due to a combination of several, of several things. Uh, government regulations is probably one of the top. Globalization, demographic shifts, government policy shifts, change in the Federal Reserve policies, and of course the adoption of revolutionary technologies. So now let's walk through three of the structural shifts that we see, the themes that we have identified, and we'll relate that to portfolio holdings uh, that we have, uh, which in total represent about 25% of the portfolios. So beginning with the first structural shift, that uh, came out of the housing crisis, as well as the Basel III and the Dodd-Frank uh, banking regulations. The themes that we have associated with that are the recovery in the housing market and also the impacts that those regulations are having on the mortgage servicing industry. The second structural shift comes from advanced drilling technologies, the revolutionary technology that's impacting the energy markets. Our theme there is the energy renaissance, but more specifically the impact that that is having on several industries. And then the final uh, structural shift is one with globalization and, an, and a technology evolution in the container ship business and the impacts that that is having on sea-based logistics. So beginning with a housing uh, recovery theme, um, you'll remember in 2011, Arnold spoke in great detail about the housing market and the pace of the recovery that, that we saw then. We felt that the housing market was bottoming and that over the next several years, that the uh, new builds would uh, gravitate back up to that million unit um, per year average that it had been at for so long. We certainly held a minority view at that time. Uh, most analysts were uh, on Wall Street were advising investors to either avoid the industry entirely or sell their stocks. They provide us a gift once again, and we gladly accepted it, buying several housing stocks during the second half of 2011. And as this chart shows, uh, the housing market did in fact bottom in 2011, and that recovery has uh, gained speed. Our investments in MDC, Toll Brothers, Universal Forest Products, and Fortune Brands have all paid off quite nicely. And of course, after shunning the builder stocks in 2011, Wall Street is now back in buying them, quite giddy in fact, from the beginning of the year. Uh, of course, that's after all these stocks have doubled, tripled, or more. The Wall Street Journal even had an article where they had a picture of a house and all the items that go into a house and suggested these are the stocks that, that folks ought to be buying to benefit from their recovery. This excitement, of course, pushed stocks to higher levels, so much so that it had discounted the, the recovery too far into the future. Those stocks hit our sell points. We sold those stocks. We still think there is legs to the housing recovery, and we continue to expect the opportunity uh, to present, present itself where we can buy these same stocks back. Uh, and whenever it does, uh, when these stocks get to our buy points, we will happily buy them again. In response to the severity of the housing crisis, the industry has seen a slew of new banking regulations. And this is causing a significant structural shift in the mortgage industry. And as a result, we see an opportunity to buy the specialty mortgage servicers. To understand this shift, however, we have to go back a little bit and look at the structure of the industry prior to these new banking regulations. This is a chart that represents the flow of a typical mortgage payment. So when a mortgage payment was made, it would go to the bank, and that bank also operated as a mortgage servicer. Now that mortgage servicer is the administrative function of separating that mortgage payment into taxes, insurance, and principal and interest. In the old structure, the bank not only acted as the lender, but was also acting as the mortgage servicer. But thanks to these new regulations, the industry structure has now changed, such that the mortgage servicing or that administrative function that was previously done by banks is now being replaced by a group called specialty mortgage servicing companies. There's $10 trillion in mortgages outstanding in the United States that require servicing. This graph shows the dollar value of the mortgages that have shifted from the banks to the specialty mortgage servicing companies since the housing crisis as a result of the new regulations that have come forward. You can see in 2008, this is a standalone business and it was virtually non-existent. Currently, there's $1.1 trillion of mortgages that are being serviced by these specialty servicers. 
And over the next five years, we expect that to move to $2 trillion, which would be about 20% of the outstanding mortgages. You can see with this transition from the previous mortgage servicers or the banks moving to the specialty mortgage servicers, those that can perform that new function should fare quite nicely over time. Well, Kenny Domiles, our housing analyst, recognized this shift in the second half of 2012. And he spent the next several months digging through the details of this new industry. It was new. There wasn't a lot of people that knew about it. He searched out consultants and other people in the industry to find, uh, uh, to find out what it, what, it, what it involved. And it became very evident through Kenny's due diligence um, that there was a several things that were quite important. First, the barriers of entry were quite high and difficult. Every executive in these specialty mortgage servicing companies has to be approved by regulators in every state. In fact, in a, in a conversation with a CFO of one of these companies, he's been fingerprinted 100 times so far this year. It was also evident that the regulations were forcing the banks out of the business. They didn't necessarily want to get out of it, but they were forcing them out of the business, which meant that there were four sellers. It also meant that those that were buying it were getting great deals. He found that there's only a handful of companies that could do it. The processing uh, uh, infrastructure required was quite significant, and there was not too many people that had that infrastructure in place. So what we found was that the structural winners were going to be, uh, there wasn't many of them, and they would see significant benefits as this transition occurred. Those companies are Aquin, NationStar, and Walter Investments. In December of 2012, we began buying NationStar, and over the next several months, we bought Aquin and Walter. As a package, these companies are up 25%. In addition, we're tracking several other opportunities in the mortgage financing business, and we hope to add those to your portfolio, and we'll keep you posted on our progress there. Let's look at the next structural shift, and that is uh, the advanced drilling technologies that are impacting the energy market. Horizontal drilling and hydraulic fracking has truly become a game-changing event for this, this industry. It's really hard to overstate just how significant this has been. It's resulting in American energy renaissance, not only changing North American energy markets, but also impacting world energy markets. In this map, we're showing the shale reserves of the lower 48. Much of these reserves were previously uneconomical just a decade ago. It's not that the reserves weren't there, mind you. They've always been there. But we didn't have the technology available at the time to economically extract these oil and gas reserves out of the ground. But thanks to these advanced drilling technologies, we can, and it is opening up this huge reserve base in the United States. With the adoption of these advanced drilling technologies, the industry has seen tremendous increase in productivity. In this graph, we show the total U.S. production of oil and gas since 1973 to present. In 1973, we produced 19.5 million barrels a day of oil and gas. And since that time, we were in steep decline through, through 2006, where we bottomed at 13.5 million barrels a day. And in the last seven years, with this productivity gains, we are now back up to 19 million barrels. Actually, I was reading last night, we are now 21 million barrels a day. So we've now surpassed the 1973 levels. This is all thanks to the advanced drilling technologies, and uh, it is changing the world quite significantly. So not only are we producing more, but we're also importing less. And this is changing the structure of the world energy markets. Here, we're looking at the reversal of net imports of oil and gas uh, for the United States. After having peaked in, in 2006 at 14 million barrels, our imp net imports are now down nearly 50 percent at just less than 8 million barrels a day. Now, many of you may remember the 2006-2007 um, time frame where the talk was is we're at peak oil and we're going to run out. Well, there was a story at the time of a Saudi prince who was commenting about peak oil and the impact that that was having on his family's favorite mode of transportation. In this article, he was talking about oil, um, but one of the things that stuck out to me is, is, uh, is his comments about that. His, he said his grandfather rode a camel, his dad drove a car, and I have a plane my grandson will be back on a camel again. 
Well, I'm not sure whether he really believed that or not, or if he was talking his book. You know, he sat on a lot of oil, so, you know, feeding the frenzy at the time and pushing the, the price of oil up, you know, served him pretty well. So maybe it was he was just looking to upgrade his plane. Um, but what we all know is his grandson is not going to be back on a camel and uh, riding that to work anytime soon. But the conversation now has changed 180 degrees. We're now talking about being a net exporter of, of energy. In fact, we're now exporting natural gas, whereas before we were opening up LNG import plants. We have 100 years worth of natural gas in this country where just a couple years ago we were thought to be running out. It's amazing what technology can do to solve issues. And this is certainly changing the world energy markets. The huge increase in natural gas production is also learning, leading to lower prices of natural gas. And we can see that in this graph. Here we compare the price of natural gas around the world in many countries. The bright blue line is the, the price of gas in the United States amongst uh, the lowest around the world, with the exception of the Middle East, whereas most other countries are selling at $8 to $14, our natural gas is priced at $4. As a result of the uh, advanced drilling many and the benefits that the U.S. has seen, many countries are now desperately trying to match the success we've had in the U.S. Uh, because of advanced drilling, but they're coming up short for several reasons. Uh, first, com countries like Japan and Korea, well, they have no shale, so that's a no starter for them. In Europe, property laws are such that the owners of property don't own the mineral light rights, so there's no way they're going to let people drill on their land if they get no benefit, so it's not going to happen in Europe. China does have shale, uh, but it's very difficult. They have a lot of clay in their shale, so it makes a gooey mess when you try to extract it. On top of all that, all of them lack the equipment, expertise, the know-how, and the in infrastructure. So even if they try, it's going to take them many years to acquire uh, these assets and be able to exploit the drilling technologies and increase their natural gas production, which is creating a significant and long-lasting advantage for the United States, and it's going to benefit those in the United States uh, that, uh, that use natural gas. So now let's look at who benefits. Certainly the U.S. consumer uh, is going to benefit because of lower utility bills, but so do many manufacturers. And this is, by the way, is one of the key factors in the American man manufacturing renaissance because many manufacturers use natural gas as input or costs. In particular, fertilizer companies, pulp and paper companies, steel mills, tire and rubber plants, Liquefied natural gas export business will benefit, and so will pipelines. But today we're going to concentrate on the chemical industry because the chemical industry has the distinct role of being the largest industrial gas consumer in the country. So by looking at the chemical industry, we know that ethylene is king in the chemical world. By volume, ethylene is the most widely used petrochemical throughout the world and serves as a key building block in the production of other value-added chemicals such as PVC, vinyl chloride, ethylene glycol, styrene, polystyrene, and that then is used to make a variety of consumer goods, like adhesives, tires, shoes, bottles, windows, flooring, you name it. Ethylene itself is produced in a process called cracking, which is done either by using naphtha, which is an oil-based derivative, or ethane, which comes from natural gas. Now, here's what gets really exciting. In the United States, 70% of our ethylene production is done from natural gas, or ethane. Where in the rest of the world, that's reversed, where most of them use a naphtha-based or oil derivative. So the low-cost gas in the United States is creating a significant competitive advantage for the domestic ethylene producers. By looking at the global cost curve among major nations, here we're going to look at 2005. This, if you, if you recall from the previous chart, this is when natural gas was at high levels in the United States. Notice on the far right, the United States is at the highest ethylene cost among the major nations, making ethylene and, uh, by extension, the U.S. chemical industry uncompetitive relative to its international counterparts. This also explains why many companies were offshoring production because they wanted to get closer to their raw materials providers. It also explains why we shut down many plants over the last decade. As a result of the energy renaissance, we're seeing a major shift in the ethylene cost curve, 
uh, today. Here is 2012's cost curve where you can see the United States is very significantly advantaged relative to all but the Middle East. Notice China, Europe, and, and Northeast Asia all have ethylene costs of 80 cents a pound or higher. And that compares the United States ethylene costs of roughly 30 cents. So at less than half the cost of China and Europe and only slightly more than the Middle East, this is driving a significant structural shift within the ethylene business, which is producing positive implications for not only the producers, but also the consumers of domestic chemicals. As a result of the domestic chemical producers, they're gaining share, and they find themselves needing to add capacity. On the opposite side, the foreign companies, the foreign chemical companies are losing share, and they'll remain uncompetitive unless they shift production to the United States and will likely see some plant closures in Europe. So in order to meet all this future demand, the domestic chemical industry is now embarking on the largest spending period we've seen in the last 20 years. We've been tracking the pace of this uh, chemical build-out ever since we identified this theme more than two years ago. And each year, the estimates for the chemical build-out has increased. Based on data from the uh, Industrial Info Resources, that's a third-party uh, company that tracks this, there's currently $73 billion that's uh, going to be spent over the next five years, and that, is, that number is going to approach $100 billion in the next seven years. This spending wave is creating a great opportunity for us to invest in companies that will benefit from this spending that's occurring in the industry. As Arnold mentioned, we like to invest in the picks and shovels. Well, in this, it's the parts and pieces that go into chemical industry. Here we take a, a look at uh, an overall chemical plant and where that 70 to $100 billion is going to be spent. 9% is in the engineering services, 43% is spent in the equipment, and 48% is spent in the construction materials and the labor. Breaking it down further, that 9% in the engineering services will result in an additional six to nine billion dollars of revenues over the next several years just due to the chemical build-out. Now these companies also will benefit from the paper mills, the rubber mills, the steel plants, but just to the chemical industry at six to nine billion of additional spending. Companies that we have that will benefit from that are Jacobs Engineering and CDI. We bought them both several years ago. 42% of the pie is represented by the equipment companies. And this, these, this group is expected to see an additional 30 to $43 billion in incremental spend. Here we own Powell Industries, Encore Wire, and a group that we've labeled top secret. While we're trying to buy these stocks, or we're close to buying these stocks, but just in case anybody in here wants to get a little jump on the action, we'll hold off to revealing the names until we've bought them. The next 48% is the labor companies, the construction material and labor companies. We see 33 to $48 billion in incremental spending. Portfolio holdings here are, again, CDI and Jacobs Engineering. They're involved in the construction as well, uh, but also in steel and Orion Marine. Additional companies in the portfolio that will benefit are Granite, uh, Emerson, and Aztec. Now, by looking at this chemical build-out geographically, we see that while the chemical projects are planned throughout the United States, the majority of them will be built in the manufacturing centers of the Gulf Coast uh, the Midwest and the East Coast. This also happens to correlate nicely with the population density of the United States and will add jobs, increase incomes, provide support for additional businesses, uh, and it's close to local manufacturing consumers, so it's going to lower the cost of freight, which will improve the competitiveness of U.S. manufacturers. All this will add positively to these local uh, communities in these regions which provides the next step in our uh, next phase in this theme, which we are in the middle of exploring, and we'll keep you posted as that progresses. Now let's look at the third uh, structural shift today, and that's globalization and the evolution of containerized shipping and the impact that that is having on sea-based logistics. So we've all seen these big boxes that are on the back of trains or in the ships, and this is, you can call it a box or a container, or the technical term is a TEU, which stands for 20-foot equivalent. But whatever you want to call it, this box has really changed the world, especially with regards to globalization. 
Now, containerization, the idea of it, was the brainchild of an entrepreneur named Malcolm McLean. Uh, he was an entrepreneur and an East Coast trucking magnate. He believed that if you package goods in standardized containers, it would save money and time by being able to move it from a truck to a ship back to a truck again. And in 1956, he tested this theory. Uh, he moved 58 containers from New Jersey to the port of Houston on a retrofitted World War II tanker. At that time, um, loading and unloading was done by hand, and, and often the, the ships spent more time in the ports than they did at sea, so uh, he had a vested interest in seeing this work. Well, on that maiden voyage, McLean's theory uh, proved out. He reduced l loading costs from $5.83 a ton to $0.16 cents a ton. With that stroke of genius, global logistics was forever changed, and at that time, the writing was on the wall for those that were looking, especially for Freddie Fields, who was a, the head of the Longshoremen's Association. That's the union that's responsible for the loading and the unloading of these ships. Well, when he was asked what he thought of McLean's new container ship, he said, well, I'd like to sink the son of a bitch. <laughs> and did he try? He and the entire industry tried through years of, of lawsuits and countless strikes. But even though they tried, 10 years later, McLean, after the introduction of McLean's container ship, the world internationally adopted it. And as you can see in this chart, along with that adoption, global growth grew dramatically. Here we're looking at a chart of world merchandise trade. And from 1966 to 1983, the number of container ports grew from 1% to 90%, and this ex dramatically expanded global growth. For the 35-year period from 1966 to 2000, that's the year just before China entered the World Trade Organization, global trade increased seven times. And after China was in the World Trade, or trade Organization, global growth increased two and a half times. So you can imagine, with this kind of growth, the shipping companies had to respond. This next chart, we look at the evolution of container ships. In the early days of container ships, the largest available ship could hold 500 to 800 of those containers, or TEUs. By 2000, just as China was entering the World Trade Organization, the largest available ship at that time was 8,000 TEUs. Just recently, the shipping company Marisk unveiled an 18,000 TEU ship. This increase in capacity is driven by two primary factors. First was the need for the shipping companies to respond to the pure volume uh, and the demand of volume because of the growth. And secondarily, because the economies of scale in the shipping industry dictate bigger ships uh, because it lowers operating costs. Now, up until recently, this evolution to bigger and bigger ships was really constrained by the desire and the ability of the shipping companies to fund these, the increased ships as well as the shipping, the shipyards, the technical ability to build the ships. But now, geography is starting to play a role. Beginning in 1996, the largest available ship at that time was too big to pass through the Panama Canal. So in response, the Panama Canal authorities drew up a plan to expand, widen, and deepen, and add a third set of locks to the canal. This expansion is set to be complete in 2014. But with the evolution towards bigger ships, that Marisk 18,000 TEU ship is once again showing that the largest available ship won't pass through the canal. Again, geography is playing a significant role and it is impacting shipping routes. Now, to put the size of this 18,000 TEU ship into perspective, take a look at this. It is about the size of an Empire State Building. Now, looked at it from another way, if all 18,000 of those containers were filled with tennis shoes, it would hold 111 million pairs of shoes. That's enough to put on the feet of every citizen in Mexico. That's just one ship. But it's not stopping there. Soon there'll be a 22,000 TEU ship. Why 22,000? Not because it's a round number but because that's the current geographical limits of the Suez Canal. So, as shippers continue to push for bigger and bigger ships 
to meet the demand and to lower their cost, it continues to put severe stress on the sea-based logistics infrastructure. Which brings us to our next theme, which is the widening and the deepening of the Panama Canal and the impact that that is having on U.S. ports. So as bigger ships are passing through the canal, these ports are, are have to, uh, and we'll see, substantial upgrades. They need to deepen and widen their ports in order to accommodate these bigger ships. There's currently $3.6 billion set to be spent over the next four to five years in order to deepen and widen these ports. That is two to three times larger than the average spend for deepening. Now, we're using a bit more conservative estimates. We think it's going to take a bit longer uh, than the four to five years. But nonetheless, when we combine this deep portening that's happening, plus the normal maintenance work that is required for, for seaports, along with the maintenance that is needed up and down the Mississippi River, plus the marine construction work that needs to be done because of the chemical buildout, plus the marine construction work that needs to be done because of the LNG uh, terminal work, we see an industry that is going to be far short of the assets required to service all this, which means it's going to be a tight market. Where we'll see higher revenues, higher income, and higher asset prices. To capitalize on this, we've bought two port dredging companies, Orion Marine and Great Lakes. And we have another group, Top Secret, which we are not about to say because we see this as a substantial opportunity. When we do buy those, you'll see them in your portfolio. Now we look at the second phase of this structural shift. And that relates to the overall impact that this is having on logistics. As these bigger ships pass through the Panama Canal, it changes the economics of shipping. And it's certainly altering the industry and it's going to produce new winners and new losers. This map represents the economics of a 4,000 TEU ship, which is roughly the average size of a ship that passes through the Panama Canal today. This black line represents the break-even line. In other words, for those areas that is, that's left of the uh, black line, it is cheaper to ship to and from the West Coast. But for those areas that are right of the black line, it's cheaper to ship to and from the East Coast. That 46% number represents the population density to the right of that black line. As we look at what happens when an 8,000 TEU ship passes through the Panama Canal, we see these economics change dramatically. You see the black break-even line? It will mean 63% of the population will have a cost advantage from shipping to and from the East Coast. The shift towards the larger population density and manufacturing centers will certainly shift the decision-making of logistics companies and shippers. And this is going to have a wide range of impacts from distribution centers, <coughs> warehousing, truck, rail, as well, as well as many other industries. But there's still too many variables that are yet to be determined for us to definitively uh, say who the winners and losers are. But we are certainly tracking this because we see it as a great opportunity. As we have more clarity and as we find uh, uh, those opportunities, we'll certainly be adding stocks to the portfolio to benefit from that. So whether it's shifting government policies, new regulations, um, revolutionary technologies, or an entrepreneur like Malcolm McLean um, developing an ingenious new idea, change is inevitable. And when we see changes, it impacts the structural, uh, we see structural shifts that impact economies, companies, industries. It's with this understanding that we build our portfolios. We identify these shifts, we sort through the winners and the losers. We use our disciplined investment process to buy and sell stocks. We are excited about all these themes, all these companies, as well as many other themes and companies I haven't mentioned today. I look at structural shifts much like a great Disney film, where when you identify a great theme, it produces the opportunity for multiple sequels. I expect that as these themes evolve, they will produce multiple offshoots, many more stock, stock ideas, and yes, even some great blockbusters. Thank you very much.